There we go. Okay. We are now officially recording. But don't worry, you're going to just see my ugly mug and our wonderful uh, presentation about the Dodgers. So, when the Dodgers left Brooklyn, the how and why behind the story. Um, many of you may have lived through this. Um, and for me, I'm looking at it more retrospectively as somebody who didn't live through it. But uh, it's something that I've studied before. I've watched documentaries about it. And I really have always found this uh, specific subject very interesting because not just so much the baseball piece of it, but also the tie-in to American culture and New York culture. Um, there are a lot of parallels that you'll see as we go through this um, to everything that was going on really in New York and, and all over the country at the time. So we fast forward a little bit to February 23rd, 1960, which is the day that Ebbets Field was demolished. You see uh, on the left hand side, that's a picture of Carl, uh, I was going to ask, but I'll just give it away. That's Carl Erskine, former pitcher for the Dodgers standing next to the wrecking ball, um, which was used to demolish the stadium in 1960. Uh, this was really seen by a lot of people um, as really the moment where it really was, it was real that they left. Uh, the team left officially after the 1957 season, but it was really apparent when they tore down the stadium uh, that they were really actually gone. But we flip the page backwards to the golden age of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Um, the famed president of the team was Branch Rickey uh, through, I don't remember the exact years. I do know he was the president up until uh, about 1950. And his big claim to fame, he did a lot of things that were great for the team. He actually started off, a lot of people may not know this, he started off as a ticket taker uh, at Ebbets Field, and he eventually worked his way up to team president. And following World War II, he decided to make a very bold decision to integrate the game of baseball. Uh, many of us know the story. We all know the man that he brought in. His name was Jackie Robinson, first African-American player to break the color barrier. He was actually not the first African-American player in the major leagues. Um, there was a player back in, I want to say it was the late 1800s, um, who actually preceded him before the game was officially segregated. Jackie Robinson officially unsegregates it by joining the Dodgers, playing his first game in 1947. Um, and the golden age of the Dodgers, a lot of people say, was defined by Jackie Robinson, also the loyal fans. Some of you indicated you are loyal Dodger fans, even though they've left now for about, it's been 60 years or so. Um, but the uh, picture that you see there is uh, somebody named Hilda. She was famous for um, <laughs> being very vocal about uh, the other team and the other team's fans, uh, some of you may remember her. Some of you mentioned Happy Felton, uh, who had a TV show where he would actually bring on kids from the neighborhood to get to play catch with the Dodgers. Um, so, you know, that's those are all big pieces of, obviously, the history, but not just the whole history, really the golden age of the Dodgers. Boys of summer. I'm going to actually now take everybody off of mute because I want to see if anybody can guess the names of everybody in this picture, starting from the left. If anybody wants to either raise their hand or hit the raise hand button, who is that on the left? Number 19. All right, Larry, I'm unmuting you. Go ahead. Who is it? Uh, Jim Gilliam, Junior Gilliam. Jim Gilliam, correct. You get the you get the bonus prize of getting the right answer and getting recognized for it because I have nothing to give you. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, standing next to him, number one. Well, my mouse is rolling over, as you can see. Hey, Reese. All right. I have two people to raise their hand. 
I heard Pee Wee Reese. Shortstop, like Pee Wee Reese. All right. Uh, next to him, number four. Dan, you look like you're going to have all the answers. Larry, you too. Who do we got? Duke. The Duke. Duke Snyder. All right. Hold on one second. I'm going to try to unmute everybody all at once. Uh, you know what? I can't do that. It's not yeah, right. There's one button there. Just unmute everybody. Oh, here we go. Okay. Hold on one second. Dan, give someone else a turn now. Okay. Put <laughs> 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 a hug. No, I... When he, <laughs> oh, here we go. I'm gonna I'm gonna unmute all. Okay, so everybody's unmuted. Jackie Robinson is the next one. Yeah, Jackie that, Robinson that is easy. the next one. That is correct. I had all four of them, but you couldn't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't hear or see, but that's okay. Who's standing next to Jackie Robinson? I can't Eddie see his this. Ever. Eddie makes this. No. I Cox. What's his number? No. Wrong. Gino hmm. Samori. I'll give you a hint. It was the manager oh. that took over after oh. Leo DeRocher. Walston Birdshot. Walter Alston? Walter yeah. Aston, correct. Yeah, yeah. Alston, not Aston. Oh, well, you know what? I apologize. <laughs> Walter Alston. Uh, uh, uh. Walter Alston. <laughs> next one's Roy Campanella. The next one is Gil Hodges. Uh -oh. Roy Campanella. Well, I used to know these guys. Guys, she's beating you. Other people have a chance, yeah. though. Okay. Ferrillo. <laughs> around the corner. What do you expect? Carl Ferrillo. Carl Ferrillo is next. Six. Yes. That's a name I haven't heard of. I used to know them by their number. Pete Alonzo. Is it Pafco? Pete Alonzo. <laughs> Andy Pafco? No. I'm going to try Cox again. Billy Cox. <laughs> Carl Ferrillo. We have Carl Ferrillo, number six. Billy Cox, number three. And then who's the that? Erskine. Carl Erskine. There's Archis. Correct. All right, I'm going to mute everybody again. Sorry. He has the name of the manager on his book. All right. So I do apologize. I spelt the manager's name wrong. Um, I'll fix that next time. If he was a Yankee manager, I would have known. Anyways, moving on. So the boys of summer um, really define the golden age of the Brooklyn Dodgers. And in 1955, uh, though I'm a Yankee fan, this does pain me to have to discuss. Luckily, I wasn't around then, so I'm sure it hurts a little less for me than it does for some of you Yankee fans who may have lived through it. In 1955, the Dodgers defeat the Yankees in seven games to become the world champions for the first time in their history. It was the first time in 65 years that they existed. Uh, the fella on the left, uh, does anybody know? You know what? Instead of trying to unmute everybody again, uh, young pitcher, 22-year-old at the time, Johnny Padres, Pitches the and uh, picks up the win in the game seven. Um, they won two nothing, and the pictures, as you could see, really tell the story. Um, and that was the defining moment for the success of the Brooklyn Dodgers through their golden age. But now we turn the page backwards once again to life in New York. And this is where I say this really, the story of the Dodgers does follow the story of a lot of people um, who lived in the city, grew up in the city. And in the late forties, early fifties, there was that call um, to move out to the suburbs, to leave the city, um, go out to Long Island. Levittown opens on Long Island. Um, and it was really considered at the time to be what they called the American dream. Um, houses instead of apartments, uh, lawns instead of fire escapes. This was really the, the vision of quote unquote making it at the time. Um, so this next clip that I'm gonna show 
uh, gives you a little bit of insight. I, st- I robbed a couple of clips from a really great documentary they did probably now about 10 years ago on HBO about the Brooklyn Dodgers. Um, so you're going to see a clip now. In just a few minutes, hold on. The Dodgers in the 1950s, Walter O'Malley becomes the majority owner of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Um, Branch Rickey leaves, and Branch Rickey actually then goes to the Pittsburgh Pirates and eventually um, actually was pioneers the first Latino player in Major League Baseball history, which was uh, Roberto Clemente. So Jackie Robinson, Roberto, Roberto Clemente, uh, Branch Rickey had a, a pretty nice resume to, uh, to show off to people. Um, meanwhile, over at the Urban Planning Commission, <laughs> uh, Robert Moses, who was really seen by many to be the most powerful person in the city. He was the one essentially responsible for everything that got built. Um, he essentially crafted the city in his image. He uh, built highways, the tunnels, the bridges, everything in and around the city was essentially because of him. Um, he had a lot of say in what happened. Um, I'm just going to go out of this for just a second because, hold on one sec, it should have been a video clip. And it's not allowing me. Okay. Hold on one second. Okay, there's a video clip that I lifted from a documentary. It's going to go now. So hopefully everybody can hear it and see it. And he said to his secretary, what should I bill him? Only well, did it for two hours. Should I bill him $200? So he's, he's simply got a bill. Modern. Fast forwarding. Going from Long Island into Brooklyn, it was a schlep. So when you went to a game, it was not cost prohibitive. It was travel prohibitive. They're not going to come in on a streetcar anymore. They're not going to walk. They need to drive. There are 700 parking spots at Ebbets Field, and that is not enough. He's no fool. He knows that those people will still come to Dodgers games. He just has to find a way to make it easy for them to come back into Brooklyn to see them. Which is exactly what the O'Malley did. Having spent years surveying Brooklyn for potential stadium sites, he had finally found the perfect one a soon-to-be-abandoned meat market on the corner of two major roadways, Flatbush and Atlantic Avenues. It was Brooklyn's version of Times Square, complete with room for more seats, space for more parking, and access to all the city's subways. And here's the beauty part. It is the terminus for the Long Island Railroad. The Long Island Railroad is bringing into Brooklyn all those many Dodger fans who had left for the suburbs they can get on the train in their towns, get off, walk upstairs, and there is a ballpark. It's perfect. It's beyond perfect. It's ideal. And Walter O'Malley, the erstwhile engineer, wasn't planning to build just any old stadium. He was thinking much bigger. He showed me in his office a dome stadium model, and he told me, this is the future, Carl. He wanted to build the finest baseball stadium known at that time. He wanted it privately financed. He wanted to maintain it. He wanted to pay taxes on it. He wanted a modern stadium. And what could be newer than a geodesic dome rising up on the corner of Flatbush and Atlantic Avenue? He was really going to give the people of Brooklyn something remarkable. Okay. So... Walter O'Malley, um, you know, it, it, history can sometimes overlook it, but uh, Walter O'Malley really wanted to keep the team in Brooklyn. Um, so he proposes this new stadium idea. Um, 
on the corner of Flatbush and Atlantic Avenues, which is like they said in the video, the terminus for the Long Island Railroad, which would be able to bring all of the former Brooklynites back into Brooklyn um, from the suburbs on Long Island. It was really considered to be the ideal spot. Um, so O'Malley pitches this and he of course, in order to make this happen, has to get around Robert Moses and Robert Moses' vision for the city and for the surrounding areas, Long Island and the Hudson Valley and Jersey. It was really supposed to be about the car. Um, car was king for Robert Moses. So anything that uh, involves city resources should be devoted to anything to do with a highway or a parkway, not a train. So this was completely the opposite of, uh, of Robert Moses's vision. So we end up with these two heavyweights going head to head with their different ideas. Um, they both had the same idea. They wanted to keep the Dodgers in New York. They had different ideas of how. So O'Malley's vision, we know, it was a dome stadium on the corner of Flatbush and Atlantic. Uh, he wanted the Dodgers to stay in Brooklyn. Robert Moses had an idea for an open air stadium on the site of the 39 World's Fair because he, the way he envisioned it was it was the geographic center of the city. Um, this was eventually, we'll talk about it uh, later, but this was eventually the site of, of course, Shea Stadium, um, which eventually did, as we know, come to fruition years later. So now we have another video clip which kind of tells the in-depth pieces of, of that whole story. Um, you'll see some different people giving interviews uh, in this clip, which I think you'll find very interesting. Um, you know, certain uh, writers, sports writers, pop culture people who, who grew up as Brooklyn Dodger fans giving their opinions and their views of it. So some of you really may be able to relate to this. Um, so here you go. Ali is a light heavyweight. He is punching above his weight class. O'Malley had first publicly stated his plan for a new ballpark in 1952. After that, in letter after letter after letter, he privately pled his case to the almighty Moses, who in response after response after response, repeatedly told him to get lost. The reality of, am I getting my message across? I want to build this stadium. I want to pay for it. I need help in assembling the land. I think it led to frustration. What is the intersection of Atlantic and Flatbush Avenue? It's the Long Island Railroad Terminal. It was directly antithetical to Moses' philosophy that city resources should be devoted to highways, parkways, and anything to do with the car. After a few years getting nowhere lobbying Moses, O'Malley dropped a bomb, announcing the Dodgers would begin playing seven games a year in Jersey City and would need to be out of Ebbets Field for good in two years. That got the attention of New York City Mayor Robert Wagner, who immediately invited Moses and O'Malley over for a chat. The two titans show up at Gracie Mansion, and O'Malley makes his case. You have an automobile. It's a lovely car but it's a 1913 car, and you just can't afford to keep up the repairs on it any longer. We have to have a new stadium. We have to have a stadium that we can afford to operate that can hold the kind of a capacity we think we need to stay in business. Robert Moses listens to this, and you can sense that he's getting angrier and angrier because Robert Moses does not want to have to sit on the same podium as Walter O'Malley, the man he's been unable to extricate himself from for the last few years, and hear what he knows to be a threat. What you say in effect to the mayor is that unless a way is found to provide a new home for the Dodgers at this particular location, that you're going to take their marbles and leave town. It is as if he is saying, is that right, Fatso? So dismissive is Moses of O'Malley. Mr. O'Malley, what will you do if you can't find a place in Brooklyn? Well, we're going to find a place in Brooklyn. We want to keep the Dodgers in Brooklyn. They belong in Brooklyn. 
We're prepared to spend $6 million of the Dodge stockholders' money to build in Brooklyn if we can get a site at Atlantic and Flatbush Avenue, the one we want. Well, I did think that the Dodgers were an institution in Brooklyn, and that anything the Dodgers wanted, he would get. I'm absolutely sold that uh, we're going to be able to work this out. But if you got that Mr. Moses was not a Brooklyn man. In fact, Robert Moses, the Manhattan-bred urban visionary, was never against building a new ballpark for the Dodgers. He simply had his own idea for its location, and it was nowhere near downtown Brooklyn. The ballpark went in Queens. The ballpark went on the site of what had been the World's Fair in Flushing Meadows. This was, in Moses' view of the thing, the geographic center of the city. You do not need any other explanation. He wants the stadium there. Walter O'Malley is playing a losing game. There is not enough leverage that he can bring to bear here. At long last, he has finally encountered somebody who he cannot defeat. He can't beat this guy. But the O'Malley was not to be counted out just yet. By June of 1956, Walter O'Malley is depressed. He closes his office door. Walter O'Malley never keeps the door closed. And for three or four days, never opened. And he didn't have any visitors. I'm concerned about this. And one day, the door opens up, and O'Malley comes out. And he says cryptically, I've just gotten a phone call from Los Angeles. I think we're going to get what we want. Powerless to take on Robert Moses, he finally has a wedge, which is, I have another suitor. Now what are you going to tell him? Well, we all thought that he was just uh, using it to get to get leverage against Moses. We figured Ball is a native New Yorker. Well, why would he want to move to California? We thought it was a con job. Los Angeles, California, with its sunshine, palm trees, and movie star cool, was, in the 1950s, an ever-expanding land of opportunity. But located 1,600 miles away from St. Louis, the National League's westernmost city, it was Siberia in major league circles. The Pacific Coast League had two teams here, the Hollywood Stars and the Los Angeles Angels. It was minor league, is exactly what it was. It was the minor leagues. One of the funniest things about the Hollywood Stars was the tourists would come and expect to see stars out there playing in this Hollywood Stars baseball game. It was indeed a long way from the majors. But as jet plane travel became cheaper in the 50s, calls had already begun for big league baseball on the West Coast. And no voice was louder than that of a 22-year-old Wunderkind City Councilwoman named Rosalind Wyman. We had no Major League Baseball, and to me that man meant we were not a growing city. We thought we were better in New York, but in many ways we weren't. Right before the World Series in 1955, Walter O'Malley gets a letter from Rosalind Wyman. I had read some obscure article that the Dodge... So... Originally, um, first of all, before I even do anything, I just want to make sure. Is everybody still with me here? All right, cool. The sound is working out? Good, good. All right. Um, so originally, Los Angeles was really supposed to be a bargaining chip. Um, you know, O'Malley wanted to put the stadium in Brooklyn. He wanted it on the corner of Flatbush and Atlantic Avenue. And as you saw in the video, no matter what he did, he couldn't convince Robert Moses to agree with him, um, whatever the case was. And there's, like I said, there was a lot of speculation that because Moses had so much stock in cars and, you know, building anything that had to do with a car, he wasn't going to approve something that was going to uh, contradict that idea. So building on the corner of Flatbush and Atlantic was like they said in the video, directly antithetical to his vision. So O'Malley gets his phone call from Los Angeles and he tries to use this as a bargaining chip um, to try and get his ballpark in Brooklyn, essentially saying, if you don't give me what I want, I'm going to take the team out of your entire town. And so 
uh, Moses tries to call his bluff. Um, he continues to assert the idea that the World's Fair is still the best site. Um, and O'Malley continues to operate as secretly as he possibly could um, at the time. So he, there's a story that he was having meetings um, during the games, trying to uh, leverage different people um, while he's sitting in the front row at the games themselves. Uh, there's a story from the 1956 World Series, uh, the year after they won. Um, and they, uh, they tell the story that he was, um, it may actually be in my next video clip. Hold on one second. I have another video clip. Maybe not. But anyways, Walter O'Malley was having, um, you know, a lot of secret meetings, really trying to keep it out of the press as much as possible. But little details do start emerging. Things start happening. Brooklyn now as a borough starts to lose some of its rallying power. Um, New York Naval Yard downsizes in the 50s. Um, the 56, they suspended the trolley cars. The trolley cars went out. Uh, things, uh, you know, they did start to change in Brooklyn. And one of the big pieces of the puzzle, some of you may remember, the newspaper, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, um, which went under. And they became, you know, the, the Brooklyn Eagle was, was really looked at as a rallying point for people in the borough to be able to um, gather and draw attention to whatever issue they were trying to fight. And without the newspaper as a rallying center, they really became a lot less powerful um, as a people. Then in 1956, uh, the trend continues. Jackie Robinson uh, gets a phone call from Walter O'Malley that he's been traded to the Giants, who uh, were the biggest rival uh, that the Dodgers had. It was really Dodgers-Giants. It was never Dodgers-Yankees. We all know that the Yankees just beat up on everybody, right? So Dodgers-Giants was the biggest rivalry in baseball at the time. And they call Jackie Robinson and trade him to the Giants. So he decides instead of going there, he retires. Um, and this was really kind of seen as the winding down of that golden age of the boys of summer. Um, and it was really the, the first big hint that things were really starting to change, uh, not just in the borough itself, but obviously with the Dodgers in general. Uh, and slowly but surely, things started to happen little by little um, with the Dodgers. Hints started to come out uh, that things were happening. Um, January 57, the Dodgers buy a 44-passenger plane. Um, February 57, the Dodgers then buy a club in Los Angeles which gets the conversation going a little bit more um, in the newspapers. So O'Malley's attempt to keep things secret was slowly going by the wayside. Uh, March of 1957, there's more stories hitting the, the newspapers about um, O'Malley meeting with LA officials. So, they're knocking on the door of Los Angeles. This video uh, will give you real insight into really the home stretch of how this all kind of went down. Well, that the Dodgers might be willing to move. And I thought, well, why shouldn't I meet Walter O'Malley? And why shouldn't we talk about it? And Walter O'Malley. Let's fast forward, because most of this we just covered. But even with this going on, it was unthinkable that it would ever happen. We heard it, but 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 but, but it, it couldn't happen. It, it just could not happen. 
when the 57 season came about, and again, they were playing games in Jersey City, and the solution of a new ballpark hadn't materialized yet, then it became a little more evident that, hey, this could possibly happen. The players knew about what the fans knew. We weren't brought into the loop. We didn't see much of O'Malley anymore. He didn't come to the ballpark at all, and uh, they said he was in L.A. In fact, he was looking for the Southern Californian equivalent of Atlantic and Flatbush Avenues. My dad is a county supervisor. He arranges for O'Malley to ride in a sheriff's helicopter. They go up in one of those old whirly birds with the bubble canopy, and they fly around Los Angeles. And they fly over Chavez Ravine. And O'Malley, the engineer, goes, there. A stadium could go there. Sandwiched by multiple freeways and close to downtown LA, the spot was ideal for a ballpark. And it had sat vacant for years, which is why county officials were happy to immediately offer O'Malley 350 acres of it, free of charge, on which he'd be able to build his very own stadium. There's no way he could have turned it down. Imagine somebody giving you 352 acres in downtown New York. O'Malley had struck gold, but he had one giant obstacle to overcome if he planned to stake his claim. O'Malley's problem, and he has a problem, is that he can't go to California by himself. He can't have the St. Louis Cardinals as the closest team thousands of miles away from him. He needs somebody else. He knew that Horace Stoneham was up against it at Polo Grounds in New York. Stoneham was up against it much worse than O'Malley. At least the Dodgers were making money. While the Dodgers were still profitable, the Giants were dead last in attendance. And their owner, Horace Stoneham, had been considering moving the team to Minneapolis until Walter O'Malley showed up with a golden proposal. Stoneham has one foot out the door. He's gone. And so for O'Malley to say, Horace, go further west, it doesn't require a lot. And so it's all lined up for O'Malley. Do you feel now that there's a good chance that your club is going to stay here in New York? Game, honestly, I haven't the vaguest idea at this moment. We know that we have a fine proposition from Los Angeles, a sincere one, one that under ordinary circumstances we would be quick to accept. The 1957 season was Walter O'Malley at his most mendacious, at his most unreadable. We haven't made a commitment as such to anybody at any place. There was a possibility that we could be a bargaining tool for him to get what he might want out of New York. I kept thinking every day, every single day, the deal in New York would be made. But no matter how much he flirted with the folks out west, O'Malley still couldn't get Robert Moses to relent and let him build in downtown Brooklyn. We are not going to flush meadows. He said, we're the Brooklyn Dodgers. Whether we move 3,000 miles or 30 miles, we will not be the Brooklyn Dodgers. What do you think of the idea of the Dodgers moving to Los Angeles? I don't like the idea. How about the Dodgers moving to Queens? I don't like that idea either. Well, where would you rather see them if you had to choose between the two? I'd rather see them right here in Brooklyn. Hey, did you hear the news about what's happening in Brooklyn? We really got the blues about what's happening in Brooklyn. It ain't official yet. We hope official it don't get. The Dodger fans will always be there to support the ball club. You think they're a pretty good bunch of fans? There's no question about it. They'll support them to the very end. But for the pawns in O'Malley's game, that wouldn't be the case. With no local newspaper to rally support and no end to the rumors of a possible move, fans in the borough of Hope finally began to give theirs up. Summer of 57, we realized that it was a foregone conclusion. It wasn't going to change. O'Malley and his lackeys were very skillful in, how do they say it in warfare, preparing the ground. This thing dribbled out and leaked out and seeped out. It was so gradual that it dissipated the anger. And remember, it was another thing, too. That fan base was not all living together. They were spread out. They were not in one place where they could gather and share their common despair. 
By the time the Dodgers played their last game at Ebbets Field in late September, callous indifference had set in. A 67-year run was ending, and only 6,200 people showed up to see the final act. You realize there weren't many fans there? Hardly any fans there. But we stayed out to say bye to them, and boy, there were more people crying than you could shake a stick at them. Why did they do it? If you've ever been in love and you have a spat with one you really care about and they disappoint you, you say, ah, oh, go on. I don't want to see you anymore. Go. We're done with you. But make no mistake, when it became official in a press release on October 8, 1957, it was the shot heard round the world all over again for Dodger fans. This time, though, there'd be no solace in waiting till next year. It happened. It's the first time you realize that something that you thought could never go is gone, and it's gone forever. There were no more Dodgers. There was no more nothing. People tried to explain it's business, this, that, and the other. When you're eight years old, you don't give a damn about business. You give a damn about where's Duke. So, any of my my former Dodger fans crying? I did. I did give fair warning before we jumped into this. I did say that uh, if you were a Dodger fan, this was not going to be easy to watch. Um, so, 1957 season ends. The Dodgers do in fact leave, and Brooklyn is left with. Obviously, a lot of different feelings. Um, as you could see in some of these pictures, they were hanging Walter O'Malley in effigy um, and a lot of different political cartoons. Uh, people were crying. Ebbets Field fell apart. Um, you know, but the point that Walter O'Malley's son makes in the video, which is that he really did get the, the bad rap of... Um, being the guy who moved the Dodgers out of Brooklyn, but it's often lost in the story how hard he tried to keep the Dodgers in Brooklyn. Uh, Robert Moses just didn't have the same vision uh, for keeping them in New York. So anger and despair in Brooklyn, euphoria in Los Angeles. Um, it was, like they said in the video, uh, the first real serious baseball team, or really the first serious sports that was brought that far out to the West Coast. Um, this really was kind of like uh, the Beatles were to the British invasion. This was kind of what the Dodgers were to westward expansion for uh, baseball and really eventually all the sports. Um, they took the Giants with them. The Giants went to San Francisco. Um, and shortly thereafter, you had te some teams that relocated out west. Uh, the Los Angeles Angels eventually uh, became a major league team. Um, you had teams, you know, because you had the Giants and the Dodgers out there, there were teams that were moving further west to get closer. You eventually, over the course of the next 50, 60 years, had expansion teams popping up in places like Colorado and Arizona. Um, it became a national uh, a national game. It wasn't just an East Coast sport anymore at that point. Um, and as you can see in some of these pictures, uh, there's Walter O'Malley. Um, you know, he got his dream stadium, the stadium that he wanted to build in Brooklyn. He got Dodger Stadium instead. Um, the reason why I also brought up before the, you know, the idea of peop of uh, you know the flight out of the cities with you know people living in Brooklyn, people living in the Bronx and Manhattan, Queens, who eventually left their apartments, they left their walk ups, and they went to uh, you know ranch houses in Levittown. They they left the city and they went for uh, more land, more space. It was the the vision of making it. And essentially Walter O'Malley did the same thing just on a bigger scale. He took the Dodgers 
out of their cramped walk up in Ebbets Field and he brought them out to their sprawling uh, land out in Los Angeles. Um, so it was really the same concept. There's, there's a big tie in to, um, you know, suburban America and how the Dodgers kind of followed suit and the Giants. And then, of course, the story goes that Robert Moses eventually, in 1964, gets his stadium on the site of the old world, World's Fair. Larry, um, you have your, your Met hat on. Um, so the Mets move in in 1964 to Shea Stadium, and that becomes Robert Moses' crown jewel uh, stadium. Of course, Shea Stadium stood until 2008. And they ripped it down and they built City Field, which uh, was really built in the image of Ebbets Field. Uh, there's a lot of um, design elements that are very similar between City Field and Ebbets Field. Uh, you know, the, the front facade is built to look very similar um, in style to it. So the culture um, that the Mets adopted. In fact, their colors, orange and blue, were actually taken from the Giants and the Dodgers. Orange from the Giants, blue from the Dodgers. And that was how they came up with their color scheme. So the Mets, as much as they are their own team, they carry with them a lot of the culture from the Dodgers and the Giants uh, right on through today. The aftermath, life after the Brooklyn Dodgers. Ebbets Field was eventually torn down, as we saw in the beginning in 1960, and replaced with a housing development. Um, the legacy is still there. It, you, I, not that anybody ever wants to, but if you're ever on the Jackie Robinson Parkway, um, my condolences, first of all. <laughs> um, but uh, ex-players have their names all over different parts of the city. Carl Erskine, uh, Gil Hodges. Um, so the legacy is, is still there. It, it always has been um, evidenced in the fact that a 33-year-old is currently giving you uh, a PowerPoint presentation about the Brooklyn Dodgers, who left the city 30 years before I was born. Um, and eventually, they did build on O'Malley's dream site. The corner of Flatbush and Atlantic Avenue was... Uh, abandoned for decades after the Dodgers left and eventually they built the Barclays Center. Um, if anybody's ever been to the Barclays Center, it's a beautiful place and it really is about as functional now as uh, Walter O'Malley really originally had the vision for. It's right there uh, where Atlantic Terminal is and it's really, um, it's rejuvenated that entire part of Brooklyn. Um, culturally speaking, it's become almost like a new downtown area. So Walter O'Malley really, as much as he is considered to be the, the villain of taking the Dodgers out of Brooklyn, uh, he was also really a, vision, a visionary. He had this image 50, 60 years before it ever actually came to fruition. This was his image for Brooklyn, and it did eventually come true, unfortunately, just without the Dodgers. But the legacy does go on. So I'm going to unmute everybody. Hold on one second, because I want to see if anybody has questions. Um, give me one second. Okay. So does anybody have any questions? So I have a hand up here. All right, Thanks, Stuart. Yes, okay. Stuart, go ahead. Two questions. One, when the Giants moved to uh, California, were they uh, financially in better shape after a year or two there? From what I know, yes. Um, I think it took the Dodgers less time to adjust. Um, the Dodgers actually won a championship in, their, I think, their second year there. Um, but I think as far as I know, the Giants ended up moving I don't know when they built um or when they moved into Candlestick Park I think they may have moved into Candlestick Park right after like as soon as they moved the Dodgers 
played in um, LA Coliseum, I think for two years before they built Dodger Stadium. Um, so I don't know if they had as quick of financial success as the Dodgers did necessarily, but they definitely eventually, uh, I would say within five years, they were, again, a very profitable team for sure. Okay, second question. Yeah. How, did the pl- how did the players feel about moving to California? Well, some of the players actually were, were shown in, in that video. They, you know, were obviously not in favor of it. Uh, they interviewed like uh, Carl Erskine, Clem LeBine. Some of those guys were very emotional about it. Um, some of them, went, you know, Sandy Koufax was on the team when they moved but he really didn't become a star until they went to Los Angeles. That was really where he became, uh, you know, their next big star. Um, But I think the general from, at least from what I understand uh, from reading up on this and, and seeing different documentaries about it, that most of the players that were there longer, they were very attached to Brooklyn emotionally. Um, They didn't necessarily want to leave, but they didn't have a choice necessarily either. I have, Couple of hands up. Um, Dan, I have you unmuted. Yes, okay. Uh, just for information purposes, if you stand at the front entrance of Barclays Center today, my dad's store was right across the street, Flappish Avenue. Wow. I was a kid and I used to take a flap, I used to live in Kings Harley, right? Up across Flappish Avenue, about 40 minutes by bus. When I was a kid, and I used to take the bus to my dad's store. The streets there were little shops and big empty lots and a gas station. There was nothing there in the corner. But my dad's store was right across the street. And I, for the first six years of my life, I lived three blocks up from the main entrance of the Barclays Center. Wow. So imagine if they would have built the stadium, you would have been able to walk to every game. Uh. <laughs> yeah. I probably would have been dead by then. <laughs> that, was a, that was a tough area. That became a very tough area. Yeah. Well, that, that's what's so interesting, too, about um, – I see a bunch of hands up. I'm going to get to everybody. Um, you know, what's so interesting is what happened to that area after the, after the Barclays Center was built is, is that it did uh, rejuvenate that entire area, sure. you know, culturally, socially, socioeconomically, too. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of the walk-up apartments that were there uh, are now rebuilt into the condos. Sure. Very expensive, yeah. Because you're right, transportation is fabulous. Yeah. I mean, that, that whole thing no about question. location, location, location. You have the yeah. bus up to Flappish Avenue all the way up to, to uh, King's uh, Plaza. Uh, and then you have the trains going any place you want. Mm-hmm. All right. So I have Mr. Mulk. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, I think the Giants, when they first moved, played in Seal Stadium. And okay. years after they moved, which really helped them, they got Willie McCovey brought, was brought up to the big club, and in uh, 61, they made, they made it to the World Series. Okay. So I, I didn't really – okay, so, yeah, 61 they made it, which was – I think the Dodgers won it in 60 also. So both teams kind of had immediate success then, it sounds like. Thank you. Um, Mr. Burkson. Brooks yeah. and yeah, my, um, I guess even though I lost my wife a couple of years back, uh, over two years now, the television, the, the computer system still wants to have her, and that's fine with me. So that's why it says Barbara up there. Uh, I want to hold up uh, four books to support your presentation, which re- I really enjoyed. Um, you, you, of course, mentioned The Boys of Summer. And that looks like this. Oh, wow. And, and the, the, Roger Khan also wrote uh, the, the era from 47 to 57, which is the uh, golden age when the Giants, the Dodgers, and the Yankees, you know, provided so much exciting baseball in New York City. Um, and, it's a, well worth, and, then, and, and then there's... 
uh, praying for Gil Hodges, you had an image, the name wasn't there, but you had an image of Thomas Oliphant in your presentation. I, I saw him, and he wrote this praying for, uh, for Gil Hodges. There's a part of this is a story about a, a priest in Brooklyn uh, who was uh, in, in giving a, a sermon one Sunday at a time when uh, when Gil was uh, when he was in a slump, uh, gave his sermon religious stuff, and, and all of a sudden ended it with, and by the way, uh, people, please say a prayer for Gil Hodges. And yeah, that, there's it, a famous story. I think it was the 53 series. He was yeah. in, like, it was like an 0 for 26 slump or something like that. And uh, yeah, there was that famous story that, they they asked everybody in in addition to the angels and the saints to pray for Gil Hodges to get a hit and break out of yeah, his stomach. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah and this was... lady is still around today. This is Dorothy Kearns Goodwin, who is known mostly as a very famous, noted the presidential historian, but she grew up in Rockville Center, and uh, her father used to take her to to Ebbets Field, and her father taught her how to keep score for a baseball game. And she became, you know, a really rapid fan, which was um, supposedly it was unusual for for girls to be that uh, that involved with the game, but maybe not. I mean, she, she, she will, it's a very touching story about growing up and, and being, uh, you know, getting close to her father through, but, Wait till next year, of course, we understand what that means. Right. So obviously you see I'm, I have a collection of, uh, of these, these books. I have a collection of uh, Yogi Berra books. And by the way, there's a brand new book out on Yogi, uh, just reviewed in the Wall Street Journal this past weekend. And um, it's, it's just so interesting that these people live on. Um, and you can talk. Everybody has their favorites. Um, I have a friend at the Shelter Rock Jewish Center who um, always wants to remind us that um, uh, he saw Jackie Robinson steal home. And uh, people, people have their stories. And they, I mean, there was a very scrappy ball club. The Yankees were like elite, but the Brooklyn Dodgers were the team of the people. Uh, it was they had a different orientation. The um, um, Red Barber used to uh, the used to wa uh, walk through um, Brooklyn and neighborhoods near the ballpark, and what he did was stop off and see the uh, the uh, the business people who owned these little stores, and um, so he provided that link. So when he came on as the announcer in the afternoon. I just met Red Barber. You know, um, <laughs> that's the kind of place it was. So that's why people were so, uh, people actually did cry. And there are a lot of people that I thought, well, I'm, 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 I'm obviously um, uh, older than, than anybody in, in this uh, Zoom program today. So um, many people in my generation uh, will constantly talk about the Brooklyn Dodgers and that. And, and and still shed a tear because it was special years, special years. Well, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing the books too. Yeah. Absolutely, that was that yeah. was fantastic. And yeah, I mean, there was, you know, the reason. I, I, and again, I didn't live through it, but um, you know, there was a a very big difference really between the Brooklyn Dodgers leaving and any other team leaving where they were, it seems like, at least historically speaking, there was a certain attachment, a certain emotional attachment. And I think part of it does have to do with the fact that the players, you know, they would take the the train to the game. Red Barber would go around on the street and talk to people. And, you know, Duke Snyder would, would take the subway to the game and they, he would see everybody. You know, it was, it was a very different type of a culture for sure. Um, I have Eleanor and George who have raised their hand. I'm unmuting. I'm here. I'm yes. Here. Yeah. My husband had to go teach. He teaches. So he had to go do his class, but I'm here. Um, as I said, I lived around the corner from Ebbets Field. Right. And 
you could go in the neighborhood and see Gil Hodge's family. Gil Hodge's family lived on Bedford Avenue. Um, I would go to a shoe store with my mother and we would see him and we would see her, his wife and his kids. They were part of the actual fabric of, this, of the area. They were part of the neighborhood. Uh, and I actually doubly lost because my dad was the biggest Giant fan and I was the biggest Dodger fan. And we used to have rivalries in my house and we both ended up losing teams. But my question to you is, whatever happened to the Polo Grounds, which is where the Giants used to play? So the Polo Grounds uh, eventually also got knocked down, also replaced with housing. Um, the Polo Grounds um, were, they were located right off of the, I think that's the Harlem River Drive. Right. Um, and it was actually, uh, geographically speaking about, I, I think it was something, it was something crazy. It was, it was like, like 500 yards from Yankee stadium or something. Like they said, you could like throw a ball from the top of, of, uh, of the polo grounds to the top of Yankee stadium. They were so close, even though they were across a river from each other. Right. Um, right. Yeah. They, uh, they knocked the polo grounds down. I'm not sure when, cause I know the, the football giants played there. But the football giants moved out of there in 56 and they moved in the Yankee stadium. So I would assume they tore the polo grounds down. I don't know if anybody knows the exact year, but definitely sometime in the fifties. Uh, Miss Smoke, you're on. Oh, hold on. I think it was 64. 64. Okay. So there you go. And that was the, that was the year that. Down around 66, I would guess. And it's low income housing, a big complex there. Yeah, um, where Polo Grounds was. Yeah, very very similar to uh, what they did with Ebbets Field. Um, Dan, and then I think Larry looked like he wanted to say something. And Marty, did you want to say something too? All right, so hold on, we're gonna we're gonna go in order. Uh, Larry, I'm gonna give you the microphone, and then Marty, and then Dan. No, I just have one comment to make. I'm a Mets fan now, but if you could see this. I was originally a Brooklyn Dodger fan. I don't know if you could read that shirt. But oh, yeah. I, I was looking for this picture. As you were talking, I was reminded. So when I was a little boy, I was a Brooklyn Dodger fan. But I switched as soon as they, well, except for Koufax. As soon as they left, I switched, especially after Koufax. But right. I, um, thank you. It was great. Thanks, uh, Joe. I enjoyed it. I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad. Thank you. Maybe I'll do one about the Yankees and the Mets too, you know. <laughs> Dan says Dan says no. Dan says absolutely not. Stu says yes. Stuart Stuart's in in on that. Uh Marty, you had a question. No, not a question, just a couple of comments. Uh I'm not from Brooklyn. Probably the only one in this group who isn't. And uh the years from 1956 to 58. I was uh, stationed in Germany in the army, so I missed all of this. Wow. And um, the thing that really interested me was the conflict between O'Malley and, um, I'm losing his name now. Uh, Robert Moses. Robert Moses, yes. Mm -hmm. It was really a conflict between mass transportation and cars. Mm -hmm. It's a fight that I think O'Malley should have won. And one of the downsides of Moses, I think a big downside, even though he did some good things like Jones Beach, was concentrating on the automobile. And we're paying for it now. Um, they wanted to build a light rail, for example, down the LIE. He was absolutely against it. He just wanted cars, cars, cars. And that was uh, his, his big thing. And I think it was a, a big mistake in spite of the fact that he was uh, a master builder, the Cross Bronx Expressway, another big mistake. He ripped down a lot of neighborhoods in the Bronx. But uh, Brooklyn, I confess I know very little about. I grew up in Queens. I'm probably one of a handful of people in the Gesundheit that grew up in Queens. But uh, we in Queens were Yankee fans. Most of us, a couple of giant fans, mostly Yankee fans. So my knowledge of the Dodgers, uh, other than Jackie Robinson's accomplishments and um, them winning the World Series finally after all those years, that's about my limit of uh, my knowledge of the, of the Dodgers. 
Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it's um, it's it's something that you know the Dodgers. Um, I I think I forget who said it, but they were really they were like a team for the people. But they were it was almost like they were like their own little secret in their little borough, and uh, they weren't the national uh, act like the Yankees were so much. Uh, Dan, you have a comment or a question or something? Couple of comments. Number one, I was April 64. I went to the last football game in, in, in the Polo Grounds. I remember that as a kid. Uh, two, if you want to read a great book, you want to learn about Moses, there's a book called The Power Broker. It is so informative about this man's philosophy and the fights that, that he won to do what he wanted to do. And he was very prejudiced. He built the roads in Long Island and the overpasses. He built the overpasses so low that you couldn't bring a bus under the overpass. He did not want the common working minority people coming out to Jones Beach and other places that he was making. He was a, he was a real character. The book is very informative. He did a real history of New York. Something else I wanted to say, but I'm having, I'm having a senior moment. Okay, that's it. I have to sign off, guys. I have to make some phone calls. Sorry. Thank you for a great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank I'm you for being here. Thank um, you. You know, it's interesting. The Power Broker was written by Robert Caro. He was actually one of the people that was interviewed in, in the, the videos. Uh, Stacy's waving her hand. It looks like she's trying to get my attention. Stacy, you're on. Yeah, so I wanted to let everyone know that hopefully once things go back to normal, I did actually have planned with, I think it was Professor Sackowitz and Ehrlich to do a presentation on um, Robert Moses, just because I find him and everything he's done so... Fascinating? Fascinating. <laughs> you know, my husband is not from the New York area. And when you are not from New York, you're not familiar with the roads. He's from the DC area, but he's not like from a rural area. He's from right outside DC, near Dulles Airport. And when you drive in the DC area versus driving in Long Island, let's just say it's a world of difference. You leave Brooklyn, you get into Staten Island in New Jersey. Okay, cool, cool, cool. You come back and you're back in Brooklyn on the, on the Belt Parkway over there and you're white knuckling it and it gives my in-laws anxiety. Now, my husband having lived in New York now 10 and a half years, He's gotten used to it. In fact, you know, we uh, would go driving on the Northern State and, you know, you get onto the parkway and like those short little, okay, do I have enough room to even merge onto the highway? You know, for someone who's not from the state, that's really intimidating. I mean, of course now he's used to it, but it just, it's really interesting. So for those of you who are interested in uh, learning about Robert Moses, I hope that was supposed to be scheduled for some time in the fall. So hopefully you guys can join us. I would love to be able to have you there for that. Um, but as far as learning about the Dodgers, Joe, thank you, thank you, thank you. I definitely learned a lot. You know, of course, I've been learning a little bit about Jackie Robinson from a book my son has been reading, but did not know as much about the Dodgers as I learned now. So thank you, Joe. All right. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, we, we should do this more often. We should. Diane, Diane looks like she's saying something. Diane, go ahead. You're off mute. I was saying thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. Really enjoyed it. I'm glad. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here with me. And uh, we'll do it again sometime. Definitely. Thank you, everyone. Um, no programming until next week, unless you want to do some exercise classes. Check out the JCC virtual website. And... Um, Unless you guys have any questions, comments, any anything, I will see you next Monday for News Behind the News with Dan Seidman on at 10.30 Monday morning. So I hope you have a great week. And that's that. Take care, everyone. <laughs>